more. And the scripture is printed in your bulletin, but I just wanted to have a little bit of time. Go over Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, because I believe that there's just some great stuff that's waiting for us there about God's word and God's word in action. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the way that only your word can speak, the way your word comes to life. Be with us as we approach your word and speak to us, open our minds, open our hearts to all that you have for us. In Jesus' mighty name, and all God's people said this morning, amen. amen. Are anybody, anyone, any of you gamers you like to play games? Play like electronic games? That kind of stuff. PS4 people? I don't know. What are, are there any other like PS4? What's the other one? Any other? Xbox? Xboxers? Yeah. Fortnite players? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm hearing amazing stuff about this stuff. You know, in my day, I'm telling you really how old I am, there was a thing called Pong. Yeah. Who remembers that? Huh? Yeah. And then there was Atari, you know? man, that rocked the house. I mean, could it be any more exciting than watching one little ball go across your screen, back and forth, going boink, 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 boink. and then it get a little bit faster, and you, you know, you're trying to keep up with it. Well, I'm, a, I'm, I'm amazed with how technology has really uh, moved forward, and then, of course, word processor. And don't you wish you had stock in Apple that went back to the days of, the, of when it first started, huh? And the word processor and graphics cards, video cards, and all of those things, can you imagine? I mean, it's just to process just so quick, fast, fast, fast. And you know what's even more amazing is that the brain functions even faster. Our brain is just constantly in processing things. And I understand that uh, even in medical technology, things like da Vinci surgery, and many of you are in the medical field familiar with da Vinci, okay? They're actually, it's almost like a video game, you know? They get in there and they're moving a mouse and everything like that, and they can do surgery um, on folks, and it reduces the infection. There's just all kinds of great things that go along with that. So you guys who are playing, you know, Xbox and Fortnite and everything else, the next time, you know, your folks give you a hassle about that, tell them, hey, I'm practicing for, you know, when I go to med school, and I'm sure they'll buy it. What do you think? Parents, are you good with that? Do you never know, you know, that, de that dexterity and to be able to do the things you need to do. But see, there's a challenge because, and I had a, a nurse friend of mine that helped set up um, the, you know, a Da Vinci program in a hospital in South Central Pennsylvania and getting the doctors through that. And the practice that was required to do that is, I mean, that's pretty technical stuff, right? Because like you wouldn't want to move, just get in there. Somebody was telling me a little bit earlier, you know, you know how it, we, we uh, what, what's one of the first things we want to do when we get a mouse? What do we usually do? <laughs> like that, find out where we are. What are the, you wouldn't want to do that over somebody's, like, kidneys or anything. It'd be a bad thing. You know, like, whoops, I guess what I deleted. But I, I understand that, you know, it makes the cuts much more minimal and recovery can be faster and everything. I think you even had that with your gallbladder, right? And they pulled it out. We'll have some pictures next week, everybody. <laughs> and I don't know why she doesn't want that. But anyway, you know, when you think about it, when I, what I've heard from the folks who have worked with those surgical procedures, that they spend so much time just setting it up and getting it in place. Am I wrong? Medical people? It takes some time to do that. And then, you know, they get in there, they do what they need to do, and then 
taking someone off of the robotics parts of the surgery. It takes more time. But as I approach this scripture, Hebrews chapter 4, I'm going to look at this for a minute because according to this, it says, you know, let's just read this through. It says, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of of him to whom we must give account. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed throughout the, through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Isn't that a great passage? Mm -hmm. uh, historians believe that it was either Paul or one of Paul's assist, associates, Barnabas, that wrote those magnificent words for the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. We get the sense of the expedience that the word of God can speak to hearts and lives. And who knows us better than the very Holy Spirit that was there the second we were conceived. You ever heard that saying, God danced the day you were born? Have you heard that? He also rejoiced the second that you were conceived. See, we, we may try and come up with, with excuses to keep God at a distance. But if we can imagine, even for a second, that there, in that sacred place, even of a womb, that the second that we were conceived, God was there. And so how much better does God know us? You think, well, yeah, but I, I haven't even had a chance to ask Jesus into my heart yet. You know what? The truth of the gospel is that God takes the first actions in mercy and love toward us before we could ever even have a chance to say, God, I'm sorry, I messed up, or I did this, could you please come into my heart? Already, even before the Holy Spirit, as we understand, even from the Luther's explanation of the third article of the Creed, that the Holy Spirit was calling, gathering, enlightening, and bringing us to the place where we could come to know the saving power and the grace of Jesus Christ. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that amazing, Mary? Can you imagine even right there? So rather than having to wait like the Da Vinci, you know, to get hooked up and everything else, God has an ability to even right now, right here, right now, whatever the circumstances are in your life, God is speaking a word and his Holy Spirit through that word as the word comes to us and we encounter his holy, inerrant, infallible, inspired, you can just go on and on about how valuable that word of God is that it has the ability to speak to our life and to quicken our heart. I have to tell you, I didn't plan on telling you this, but you're not going to pay extra for it. And I'm going to hold the sermon even longer because I'm going to tell you this. I believe you have to understand I, I'm perfectly cool and I understand there's sometimes folks need to go for counseling. That's okay. Meds, pastoral care, pastoral counseling, all of those things. But I have to tell you that in my ministry and the things I've experienced, that 
There are times that I've, I've seen where simply a person who surrenders their life to Christ and God comes in and removes a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't need to be hanging out on us and fills us with his Holy Spirit. That the word of God is expedient and powerful to break strongholds and move us from that place of brokenness exponentially, delivering the healing power that we need. And he does it without any help from us. It's almost like God saves us single-handedly. Andreas, without any help whatsoever. Because he loves us and because the word of God is living. You ever notice how you can read the Bible, say Psalm 23 or something, and maybe you've read it every day of your life. You know, the Lord is my shepherd, day in and day out. Have you ever noticed how it really is alive? Because you will no doubt see something that you hadn't seen before. That's just the nature of the word. You come to a new way of understanding. You'll see things in a new way, and it's a beautiful thing. And so Paul will write, and he'll talk about how powerful, living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. I understand there, there are things that are even sharper than scalpels. Is that a laser? With much more precision than even a scalpel can get. God has a laser gaze and is able to look upon our hearts and he knows the things in our hearts and our minds that need a word of grace and mercy. He knows the things in our hearts and some things we bring about ourselves and some things just start just happen. Some, sometimes things just happen. God's grace, when he looks upon us with those laser eyes of burning grace. You look in, in Revelation and you get this picture of Jesus as he appears. He is just he's beautiful and he has these laser eyes. And his eyes are not there to slice you. You've experienced that. Haven't we all experienced that at some point? Someone who's taken us off at the knees. Someone who cut us in a very, very painful way, in one way or another. And yet when he looks, he looks to bring healing. He looks to bring the care and the mercy and the grace. And God knows, as the scripture says, he's a dis discerner of our hearts and our minds. And in verse 13 says, there's no creature hidden from his sight better than the best binoculars. Not a single thing ever goes unnoticed. People I've talked with that have had near-death experiences or they have, have had death experiences and come back have told me that heaven is a place they described what heaven was like. They said, heaven is a place where you can hear all the birds and all of creation singing at once, and yet you can make out each individual voice. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. God knows us. He sees us. Nothing is hidden from his sight. The scripture says. And then he goes on, verse 14. And there's this magnificent word of grace and mercy that comes, comes flying out. He says, because the writer says, seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold Fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in 
all points tempted as we are yet with all, without sin. Can you say that with me? Was in all points tempted as we are, yet he was without sin. Listen, I'll tell you what. I think there's a reason. You ever, remember that gal that was about to be stoned? And Jesus said, those of you who are without sin, you can cast the first son. I think there was a reason. Remember that? Do you remember that scripture? Who dropped their stones first and headed home? Do you remember that? There's the old guys, right? They dropped them, <laughs> starting with the eldest to the youngest. Why? I, you know what? <laughs> Since you asked, let me just share my phone. Don't we, as we age, get a little bit more understanding about our own frailties? and our failures. And the times when we had successes and the times we fall flat on our faces. Amen? Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. I guess, is, this, is this the place where there are no sinners here, right? Are you all, you're all sinners saved by grace, right? Isn't that a great thing? Sin is sin, the Word says. And you know what? There's any number of reasons why folks fall under temptation. You can say, well, I'll never be tempted about X, Y, or Z issue. Well, you know what? Chances are you just haven't had opportunity yet. So a little bit of humility goes a long way. And I love the fact that the word says that Jesus knew what temptation was. You know what? I looked that up in the Greek because I wanted to see what the word temptation meant. And that he was tempted. And guess what it means? Means he was tempted. Were you at the first service? Are we? Yep. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for hanging out. <laughs> oh my goodness! I was reading a book that was uh, over the summer. I was reading on marriage, and uh, it's called. Uh, it was by Dave Carter, and he wrote this book called Anatomy of an Affair. And he talked about some of the reasons and how affairs can happen. And the brokenness you can't get around. But therein is also the power of the gospel for forgiveness and trust to be reborn. And for anyone who would like to think they can't be tripped up, let me just run this by you for a second. Because there's any re number of reasons why we can get have close calls, if not complete failures. First off, our backgrounds. Perhaps we have pains or traumas early in our lives. Second, I've, I've become increasingly aware of the importance of biochemistry and the way the brain is soaked in this stuff. Things like the endorphins or the pain receptors or any number of, of things, the dopamine, oxytocin, or, or any of the, the other biochemical things. And let me tell you, you think you know somebody and somebody's going to be the same way forever? Get their body chemistry out of black and you will have almost a brand new personality. Amen? And if you haven't experienced that, I'll tell you what, depression is one of those things that when our, when our blood chemistry or some other reason in that, I'll tell you what, it can make us think things we would never think. And it can, it can make us prone in ways that we think we would never be tempted. Let me tell you what, you think some of you make are here and you're thinking, I could never be tempted to rob Harris Teeter. Well, let me ask you a question. Under the right circumstances, I guarantee you, you would. If there was some kind of a hurricane that went through, and you had babies that needed food, you'd knock that puppy over in a heartbeat. Amen? Sometimes circumstances affect the temptations that we are faced with. Jesus knew what temptation was. Sometimes culture or society, things that are going on in our culture just make 
particular thoughts and ideas that much more prevalent and so it's easy to get hooked in and to buy in and it's a combination of things don't think that it's just one particular issue and I'm just listing a few things sometimes when you're under enemy attack itself sometimes the devil gets too much credit wouldn't you agree but there is a very real presence of evil that can bring on those kind of attacks sometimes when you're grieving or someone else's pain is spilling over onto you and the opportunity is there and the weakness is there on your side. Sometimes major changes going on in your life and pressures that you're carrying. Sometimes we get tempted and we fall because we forget who we are and we forget whose we are. Are you with me? To all of these things, to all of these things, the writer says, seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Aren't you so thankful this morning that we have a Jesus who is our great high priest, the great high priest would make, would make petitions unto God, but would also present the offering, the sacrifice unto God. He became the ultimate sacrifice for you and for me. What we need is we need a great high priest who is able to speak a word of grace. And we carry that out because, you see, simply reading the scriptures without allowing the Holy Spirit to so infill us and work through us, healing, we're very rarely ever able to extend it to others. In their challenges and the things that they faced. So we need to not only be hearers of this word, but doers, those who practice it, and it's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that those things can happen. And that everything we do, everything that's done, is done with compassion. As we reach out, as we care for others. Jesus had this big thing about who he was and what he was about. He said, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. Because he has sent me to preach good news. To restore sight to the blind hearing to the deaf, to loose those who are in chains of bondage. Aren't you glad we have a great high priest? Praise God. Let's pray. And uh, you're welcome to stand. Worship team, if you want to head up, you're welcome to. God has the power to not only see us and put his finger on the things inside of each of our hearts, but he has a way of speaking a word of grace and welcome. He knows our hurts even better than we do. He's the only one who has the power to bring the lasting transformation and lasting if that's you this morning, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, who is our great high priest, thank you, Lord God, that you hear us, you know us, you know the desires of our hearts, you know our failings as well, you know the times when we rise to the occasion and the times we fall flat on our faces, and you know the things that trip us up. Thank you for your grace, thank you for your mercy. Lord, this is a house where we don't throw mud or bricks on our brothers and sisters. This is a grace place. And grace doesn't mean greasy or easy because it's only by your blood that the great high priest has made everlasting 
everlasting intercession for us. Lord, we need your Holy Spirit. We need your power to cleanse us, heal us, forgive us, restore us. And now, Lord, I bless your people. As you work that work in each of us that only you can accomplish, it's by your grace that we've been saved, not of ourselves, lest anyone should boast. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If this message touched you this morning, I'm just going to ask you people, just raise your hand. Just know this is a timely word for you. I'll tell you what, it's a timely word for me. Sometimes I beat myself up, and I need to hear that word of grace. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We give you thanks and praise. Amen.